Welcome to episode 143 of the Sports Geek Podcast. In this week's episode, I chat digital, helicopters, and LA Clippers with Jen Van Dyke. Welcome to the Sports Geek Podcast, the podcast built for sports digital and sports business professionals. And now, here's your host, who keeps telling himself 40 is the new 20, Sean Callanan. Thanks, DJ Joel. You don't need to remind me. I have got a birthday coming up. Uh, My name is Sean Callanan, and you are listening to the Sports Geek Podcast. You're most likely doing that on Pocket Cast because I mention it on every bloody episode. So surely you're on board. Go check out Pocket Cast. It is my favourite podcast app, but you might be listening on iTunes or another platform. Uh, Please let me know. Uh, You can always contact me, Sean Callanan, on Twitter, on the Sports Biz Slack, uh, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, or you can use the old-fashioned method of sending me an email, uh, sean at sportsgeekhq.com. I uh, really enjoyed this chat with our, with the guest of this episode, Jen Van Dyke. I caught up with Jen when I was in LA at the last leg of my recent uh, Sports Geek trip. Um, caught up with her on the Friday, and then on the Saturday, uh, came back to see the Clippers in action against the Cavs. Uh, unfortunately, most of the Cavs didn't turn up with LeBron, Kyrie and uh, Kevin Love all uh, sitting on the sidelines. But I did get to meet with some really cool digital folk uh, before the game um, with Jen and sort of talk to them about what's happening in the scene in LA. So I was really looking forward to catching up uh, with Jen. And so here is my chat with Jen Van Dyke from the LA Clippers. Very happy to welcome Jen Van Dyke, Chief Strategy Officer and Vice President of Partnerships at the LA Clippers to the podcast. Welcome, Jen. Thanks, John. Good to be here. Well, very lucky to meet you in person while on my recent trip to to LA. And you are one of the most interesting people that I did meet on the trip. No, not to to besmirch everyone else that I met, but your background um, is very unique in the sports space in that you've come from the agency background and then worked um, at the team at the league level with the NBA and now now at the Clippers, I want to dive in a little bit of back into your background and your consulting and agency background with IMG Wasserman. Do you want to sort of take us through a bit of your career and how you got started in the sports digital space? Uh, sure, sounds great. Um, I had I went to a women's college in Western Massachusetts, Don Holio College, and we didn't exactly have a business or a sports. Uh, curriculum. Um, so I was a politics major yep. and upon graduation landed myself at IMG. Uh, and there's a much longer story there, but we, we can get to that another time. Yep. But uh, IMG in the late nineties, Todd McCormick, the son of Mark McCormick had just started TWI interactive, which was his um, answer to the burgeoning trend of narrow band internet access in the late nineties. And he really thought that IMG should be in this space. Mark actually didn't agree with him. And so Todd went out and got independent investors to help start TWI Interactive as still a a part subsidiary of IMG, but ended up becoming a really interesting company in the early sort of dot-com space in sports, largely because we were able to leverage all of IMG's major sports relationships, going back from Wimbledon and the RNA of 35, 40 years at the time, to new things they were doing but to bring a new angle to it of what the internet could do for those types of investments. And really I came out, you know, 20 something years old, knowing a little bit about the internet and wanting to learn everything I could about the sports business as soon as I landed at IMG and the beauty of IMG at that time. And still today, obviously is the breadth of that agency and the global relationships that that agency had. And I was able to very quickly navigate into a, uh, a sort of area of expertise of sports rights and the sports sponsorship business and technology and how those two things could overlap and work together to really help everyone that had a stake in those investments. And when you think about who that is that have a stake in those investments, you have teams and leagues that are trying to figure out digital and how to grow revenue in that space. You have brands, uh, in particular technology companies, that are trying to understand, yes, I want sponsorship assets, but no one seems to want to give me content in my sponsorship deals. How do I go get content if I'm a mobile company, for example, or an electronics company? 
Um, and I was able to really grow very quickly between the worlds of, of content and digital and the, and the brand needs at IMG. And it was a really great place to start. It really is the birth of, the, of that sport, sports internet uh, side of things because, yeah, you're, you're working with the rights holders that are trying to figure out how to get into the space um, and, and, and the sponsors wanting to be a part of it. And this is, you know, pre, pre, pre all this social media, pre, pre, this is just, you know, websites uh, and, and those kind of things and trying to figure out, sort of put that, put that futurist hat on to go, where is this, where is this going to go? Um, and that's sort of that space where everyone was sort of figuring out at the same time. Exactly. And that's where, you know, it was interesting because it would also had a lot to do with IMG's strategy in the sports space at the time of how successful we were. For example, you know, some of the crazier things we did was try to make narrowband video heavy websites, you know, showcasing Nobel Prize winners back 50 years. Yep. But one of the smarter things we did was not make uh, seven, eight, nine figure rights commitments in the digital space during the time when there were a lot of Quaka sports and other things out there that, you know, thought they had to buy their way into the business. Um, and those companies obviously didn't fare that well long-term, whereas IMG was able to, to learn from it and really figure out that the business model was probably either in I, IP development or in consulting, which was the side that I lived on. So in that consulting, consulting side, were you were more working with the, with the technology vendors or the brands or the, or the rights holders and the, and the teams and the leagues and events that IMG were associated with? Uh, the beauty of it was is that it, it was a mix of them, although at IMG it was more on the brand side. Yep. We had uh, Philips Electronics as a global client early on in 2001, 2002, and Philips hired IMG to be a global sports marketing consultancy, but they said early on they wanted to spend almost one-to-one -one in dollars between digital and sponsorship, wow. which was just unheard of yeah. at the time. And they had two big global platforms that we helped them you know, strategically develop and then execute. And one was in global football, which centered around the fact they still had World Cup rights at the time um, and a national federation strategy. But then the other one was action sports. And for action sports around the world, right, even today that has more faces and, and angles on it yep. than one brand could ever hope to own. And so we created something really unique there that I'm still actually really proud of, and it was called the Phillips Web Syndicate. Because we knew early on that Phillips didn't have enough money to build a website and then spend the millions of dollars to drive people to it. Yeah. I mean, that's what people were doing at the time. Um, so we created what was actually one of the first con digital content syndication engines where we, uh, TWI Interactive, built this technology, and we were able to syndicate action sports videos to action sports websites that already existed, but we were able to wrap them in Philips branding and, and tie that back to, to that program. So we were able to actually distribute, I think it was over like 3 million unique visitors um, with this action sports content for Philips, when meanwhile they didn't have any other way to cost effectively build that awareness with that audience at the time. And this is at a time when the web wasn't as connected as it is today. It doesn't have the glue and the pipes that it does today. And blogging was on its, it was starting to rise and these mini sites were starting to rise around different sports like action sports. So you effectively just built out a system to say, hey guys, if you want our content, here's our content, you can embed it in your systems. But it's had, had, the, had all that Phillips branding. Right. And we were offering them content because this was back in the day when, you know, people weren't making video. Yep. Um, and so, and certainly didn't have the budgets for it. So we were offering, and I still remember we sent crews to four different regions of the world and including getting a phone call of my poor videographer caught at the border patrol in Shanghai, trying to get in to shoot all these action sports events around the world. I mean, it was amazing, but we got video and we distributed globally too, to help create that. Cause that, those sports are so globally driven that it wasn't about a local fan base. It was about really connecting kids all over the world. So then how was, uh, so, so to go from IMG and being in that, uh, the genesis of, you know, the sports internet space, well, then what was it like going to, uh, being at, at Wasserman and the different focus that, the, that, that you had at Wasserman being sort of driving their digital and that digital team at Wasserman? Yeah, it was fascinating too because IMG was so golf and tennis, yep. you know, based, um, and whereas Wasserman was really more on the team sports side, particularly in the NBA. 
So when I was offered the opportunity to go to Wasserman, it was to run the T-Mobile NBA account team that Wasserman um, had because they were, you know, assisting in every aspect of T-Mobile's NBA and, and other sponsorship relationships at the time. And so that was great because it allowed me to bring the digital experience of negotiating on behalf of tech companies in sports to a, a partnership that was really very traditional on the surface of it. I mean, this I walked into a relationship where they had already started the very famous Charles and Dwayne ad spots yep. of who's in your fave five. And it really nailed it on the cultural phenomenon side. But in terms of T-Mobile and content for the NBA on their phones and to their subscribers, they really hadn't touched it yet. So that was a cool opportunity to do that and be part of that and really get to know the NBA folks and, um, and every stakeholder kind of in that mix uh, through those years. And then at the time, Wasserman actually didn't have a digital consulting component. Yep. Um, Casey Wasserman, who I worked for and, and have a tremendous amount of respect for, believed in it, but wasn't really sure on the angle on it. And so we started with a project with the U.S. Olympic Committee, actually, to help them do a digital strategy leading up to the London Games and the athletes coming home from the London Games. Yep. And that really started us into what was what was and still is a great consulting business for Wasserman that, on the one hand, represents athletes and helps them figure out their digital to get more sponsorships, but also works very closely with major brands you know, negotiating for content in their deals, as well as teams and leagues trying to understand how to make more value and sell these assets at a premium. And it, it, it's sort of, you know, in hindsight, you know, Monday morning quarterback style, looking back, it just makes sense because it's a missing piece because you had, you had the talent in either the athletes or the relationship with the teams, and then you've got these brands and, and you need to help them make that connection of, well, this is how to best use this asset. This is how to use these platforms because you can't rely, even till today, that the that the sponsor will know that the brand will know how to do it, and and whether it's the you know an athlete or a team, they're still trying to figure it out themselves. So that consulting space makes perfect sense for that business at Wasserman. It's it's tremendously valuable, and I think that's really where I mean, even today we see non technology brands wanting content in their partnerships, yep. right? I mean, you have brands like you know in the PepsiCo family that don't need awareness, but need those consideration driving elements. Um, and so I do think it's, and, and those things are treated completely differently by rights holders. I mean, you start asking for content, suddenly you're having a, a broadcaster or, you know, an MSO conversation. Yep. Um, it's only really been recently that there's that middle ground of kind of sponsored content and branded content opportunities for brands. And definitely, I think also that the, the, the athlete is the massive opportunity for, for brands, because if you haven't got that league-wide deal that's getting access to all of the assets and all the IP, you can can get that content opportunity with a particular athlete, and the athlete needs to understand how to use those platforms. They need to understand, you know, how they need to interact with fans. But they're a really big content opportunity that doesn't come with the high cost of going to the league. Oh, completely. Plus, you put a face on it, yeah. right? I learned early on in the in the T-Mobile days, you have Charles and Dwayne as the face of your campaign. You're you're just that much more relatable and that that much more authentic. And I think that's what Casey's done brilliantly now by acquiring Laundry Service and the the Cycle platform of really now trying to do that on behalf of athletes and that those cool content things that that garner tens of millions of engagements. So, so you've been in the agency side, working in golf and tennis and, and different products at IMG and then working with, with the NBA and athletes at Wasserman. You then went over and worked with uh, the NBA's Teambo, as it's known, Team Marketing and Business Operations, which is effectively, effectively the league's agency for teams and, and its own consulting business inside the NBA to, to help out teams. Is that a good description of what Teambo does? No, it's a perfect description. I mean, we kind of, you know, lovingly call it a McKinsey for teams. Yep. Um, but it's it's absolutely one of the best consulting resources in sports. Um, and it's, you know, completely free and available to uh, to the teams. And what's so great about it is they have about 45 people in, that are experts in every aspect of a team's business. So when I was there, I was related, you know, I was involved in sponsorship, marketing and digital aspects, but... They have you know, people in analytics and arena operations and everything else to really help the teams compete on the court but collaborate off the court. And it really is, I think, part of the success of the NBA as a league today. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've, uh, you know, a good friend of mine, uh, Kirsten uh, Corio, who you worked with at Team Bo, like the, the, the stuff yeah. that they, the stuff that they do and, you know, the collaborative nature and lucky enough for me to know a lot of people in the NBA, it is one of the most tight knit uh, leagues, I think from a, from a, and it's, it has a very collegial feel from a team to team point of view. Yes, you go complete, you know, you go to war when you're on the court and, and there's, there's that, that competitiveness, but there is a bit of lot. There's definitely that rising tides lift all boats, and I think the NBA and Team Bo has helped make sure that everyone's coming along along for the ride. And I think it's a it's a it's a model that other leagues they are trying to follow, but they should definitely be looking at it as as league best practice. Exactly, because it's it's best practice for all of us at the team level, but it's also um, a sort of collective, you know, advocating body for team interests. Um, and what I think the NBA is also really good at is understanding where guidelines help protect everyone and grow the game and the business and where guidelines, you know, serve a slightly different purpose and, and need to evolve. Um, and that's where we see a lot of new opportunities in the digital space in particular, where teams now being able to, uh, you know, put content on social platforms and the social platforms will sell against that team content for teams to share in the revenue on that. Um, and that's a tremendous opportunity for us as a, you know, as a team that is otherwise confined to 150 mile marketing, physical marketing radius, the digital content opportunity is really unique in the NBA. So you do, you do raise that. And a lot of people, you know, I do tell a lot of my uh, people I talk to and when they're talking about the NBA is that that physical uh, 150 mile radius around your team. So just to, Again, I'll paraphrase and you can correct me, but all of the NBA teams are allowed to market in their own market, but that's but it is but it is restricted. So from a partnerships point of view, you've got your market, um, you know, 150 miles from from LA, and that's where and that's where it ends. And so it, you can't do national partnerships and those kind of things because of the agreements that you know the league does nationally. So that that is one of the the, the restrictions, but it also means you've got to be very innovative in your in your in your market um, from a, from an NBA team point of view, isn't it? Yeah. I, there's probably a couple exceptions, right? Like they did open some rules recently where as long as we don't go market, you know, for example, we're obviously in California, in LA, but as long as we don't go into downtown Oakland or downtown Sacramento yep. and in those teams, 75 mile radius, we can with the permission of the league do full state and some adjacent state marketing programs yep. now. But you're right, overall. However, digitally, and in particular socially, we can more market against our whole fan base and our audience for who they are. Yeah. So that means I can target Clippers fans internationally, um, you know, based on brands they follow or things they're interested in. And that starts to give me a lot more opportunity than to really create content and monetization opportunities with my virtual fan base. Exactly. And, that, and that's where the NBA has, has definitely evolved. Like those rights agreements and those marketing regions – are historical. They've been there for years and years, and now this digital play comes in. And yeah, as you know, in your now new role at the Clippers, you've got Clippers fans around the world. You know, because of whether it's because of the team or whether it's because people are following certain players around from team to team, you've now got that. So those agreements have to be malleable at a certain point to go. Well, we're going to push our content out here, and this is what the this is what the uh, the LA Clippers brand is going to represent, and this is what it's going to offer from a from a global perspective and it's content led and it's you know it's what you push out the partnerships the data that you can capture as a as a result of that is is where the real value is for you guys completely and you said my two favorite words content led yes um that's exactly how i you know i see frankly the real monetization opportunity for for any team especially an nba team and especially us the la clippers um, I think this is the beauty of having spent so many years consulting and looking at so many other different types of sports and industries is, you know, I haven't, I have yet to see, to see the data of an American sports team that shows that more than 10% of their total social media followers live within their DMA, Yep. which means by default, you know, your digital strategy and the way you're interacting with your digital fans and making money off them is fundamentally different than everything you've probably always already done right, is sell tickets to them in market, drive them to your local broadcast, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's really kind of an interesting element now of why we need to think strategically about our audiences and our fans to really go after them in a premium way. Um, and social is perfect for it. 
Yeah, uh, Claire Lewis did a really good uh, panel at uh, South by Southwest uh, with uh, Mike Connolly, who's at the at the at the Cavs. Um, and she talked about. Oh, he's awesome. She talked about the the ninety nine percent of fans that don't get to go to the stadium. You know, one percent of your fans are going to Staples and watching the games, but the ninety nine percent of these digitally active, consuming it in multiple ways, whether it be you know whether they're opening up League Pass and watching a game, whether they're going to the Clippers site and watching you know highlights, all of that kind. They're the they're the fans that we are still in the we're still in the early monetization phase of that. How how is that going to how is that going to look? And it's it's going to be led by content. Whether the content is highlights and and game footage behind the scenes, you know, uh, magazine style, um, doing what everyone's doing, you know, uh, plays in cars, singing along songs, pretending you're doing the James Corden bit because everyone's doing <laughs> it, right? But it's but it is content yep. led, and then that's where you know partners want to be involved. But it is also that there's also that data play. Um, from my point of view. Like what? What was really interesting was how your role um, is is structured. In that I, you know, I sometimes joke um, that I'm a digital divorce counselor working between partnerships and and digital teams to get them to work working together and get them on, working on the same page. Um, but you, in your in your role, you are overseeing both of those both of those departments. So to sort of get them in. In in lock in lockstep, how has that been? You're now 11 months or so into the role. How how has that been getting those teams? You know, I guess on the same page, working together, working hand in hand, um, getting that relationship working with those two teams. Yeah, it's a great question because, and the answer is, I don't think I've learned this much in the in 11 months in my life. Uh, yep. um, and it's been so much fun and and exciting. And look, we put these two together in my role. Uh, very intentionally because, you know, we know the NBA collectively believes it and Gillian Zucker, the team president and Steve Ballmer, obviously our owner, they believe it for us is that, you know, digital in many machinations um, has a lot of contribution to our current and future revenue streams. And really that those opportunities have not been maximized. It, it certainly though is way easier said than done. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I did before I went to Teambo was consult two teams and do digital workshops in market with them about how to sell digital, especially social at a premium. And, you know, and really when it comes down to it, having the right team structure and frankly, the right people and skill sets in the group is critical. And we had that when I inherited the sponsorship team here, we didn't totally have it on the digital side. So we had the opportunity to, to restructure a little bit and, and we brought in some expertise in content strategy from the, uh, a gentleman from the music business and in digital content production, a really great guy from EA Sports and Nike Basketball. And so to bring in some of that experience and now to really have the team and the structure, the third piece is the process and the execution. Um, and it, you know, it maybe hasn't come together as fast as I wanted it to this season, but but all of the right seeds have been laid, and I'm and I'm excited to see where we're going. I'm really proud of the content we're producing this playoffs because I think it's the first that we've had a chance to really sit down, build a strategy against both the production and the strategic distribution of it, and and now seeing the results of it and the the engagement's been great. And the thing is, it it is that process thing because it's sometimes the content team will come up with it. Absolutely awesome con a content piece that they want to roll out with, and then it's a matter of getting that con that consultative process to talk to your partnerships team to sort of figure out does this fit does this fit with one our brand does this fit with the sponsors brand can we make this sync up right and so it's not a contentious uh, hey guys we've got to slap a logo on that piece that it's more it it has to be collaborative and so it is trying to get that process right but then also having those people that aren't digging their heels in on, you know, I've got to put logos on this or this piece is too too important for to have sponsors on, which is normally the two extremes you have in that in that argument, but it's trying to get that process right, isn't it? That sound like <laughs> That's a, exactly the argument that, that you have. That's a sound like a snigger of uh, of uh, of experience. It's something you've gone through a few times. Yeah, it sounds like you have too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's exactly that, right? And you know, and really and this is why we love salespeople is salespeople should push. And when salespeople understand that they can sell digital at a premium and come up with cool ideas with their digital team, they get even more excited to push. Oh, yeah. Right. And sometimes, 
you know, that enthusiasm still creates other challenges downstream, but, um, but it's the right place for us to be. And I'd rather see us go, you know, try too hard, um, and come up with some stuff and see what happens than, than not. But for us, it's also steps in a plan to, you know, to a, a bigger place. And that's where you've probably heard a little bit about the over the top service, mm-hmm. um, that Steve Ballmer's mentioned in a couple things. And really, you know, for us launching, a subscription service by by 18 um, is kind of an interesting opportunity and, and will force us in a good way to be even more content-led maybe than we were yesterday. Oh, c- uh, completely, completely. And, and the thing is, I mean, and again, I think uh, Russell Stepford, who I'm hopefully going to be catching up with soon, who's at, who's at Barcelona, you know, he he's, head, he's head of digital and they asked how many people does he have in his team and he said 75 which is like, mate, you know, you should be, you know, Jamie Tabor from uh, Leicester was there. He fell off his chair. He said, "There's only there's nearly seventy five people at the total of Leicester." Now, when you go back and when you go back and look at Russell's uh, remit and what he's covering, he's got a TV, a twenty four seven TV station, and he's got fourteen teams to cover. That's why he has, you know, he, he has that uh, he has that size team. You know, TV. You know, when you're running a full TV channel, which is effectively what an OTT service is, if you're going to run you know, um, as a click the button and watch something about the Clippers, the amount of content you have to produce becomes TV station like. Um, so it, it's you know having that in in place is going to be you know res- really resource heavy in in producing it. But it's also then you've got to have the the smarts of the people to go. Well, we've got to produce all these cool shows and that you know that creative. It's not just hey, we've got to have soldiers because you've got they still got to have that creative. So this content is actually worth watching that people want to subscribe with. So that the 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 size and the opportunity and growth that's in uh, in that sports digital space is still there. And if you know you can look at uh, the big European clubs and what they're trying to do and what they are currently doing um, as a bit of a template to say, well, that's the place we want to get to. Um, the global reach of the game, in this case basketball, is getting bigger and bigger all the time. Uh, that that is that is the opportunity from a revenue point of view uh, for teams. I agree completely, and I think you nailed it with the reference with the uh, the global football clubs too. And and it really started with the leagues in the U.S. when you know NFL Network and NBA TV and MLB TV when the when the leagues realized they needed that twenty four seven network in addition to the live games that they were selling out to broadcasters, right? In order to really create that monetization mix and get it right. The, the global soccer clubs or football clubs now have that as well. And honestly, I don't think the, the teams in the U.S. at least are much further behind because as, as all of us grow and start to take on more content production and understand these monetization opportunities to different audiences, the amount of content, the type of content we're creating is only accelerating. And it makes sense to have multiple distribution outlets that teams can control and possibly some that we share, right, with other parties. Completely. Um, but really, in order to do that. And, and the thing is, no one in the last five to ten years, everyone has been under-resourced, and every time they add more resource to create more content, no one's, ever, no one's been saying people are consuming less. Every time you increase no. the amount of content you're producing and you keep up that high-quality bar, the con- you know, the, the video views go up, the consumption, the deeper engagement happens. And so we haven't hit that point of the fan putting up their hand and saying, enough. We haven't reached that yet. And so you we should be, haven't. No, and you should just keep doubling down until we do. And here's the best part about it. We haven't reached the saturation point for consumption, but also the the value a partner is willing to pay for content association is not connected to the length of that content anymore. Yeah. So teams don't need to produce 30 minute shows, right. To satisfy advertisers. We need, you know, 30 second gifts mm. um, and other formats that are really work and, and connect the message of the brand with the fan. And, and that kind of production, it sounds easier, but it isn't because it does require that creativity and that sort of endless cycle of it. <laughs> yeah, it is an it, it is a beast that needs to be fed the, that 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 content machine. You've mentioned uh, uh, your owner Steve Barmer a few times. 
Um, obviously, he's a tech-savvy owner, um, being a, a long-time CEO of uh, Microsoft. What do you think? What do you think advantages that brings to you? Like the NBA has now got more and more tech-savvy, entertainment-based uh, owners that are coming in with that that experience and that money, as opposed to you know older money, whether it be from oil or or other things. What do you think, Steve, being you know digitally savvy and being the, the being the tech guy that he is? What do you think he brings to you as an owner and enables you to do as a as as running you know everything digital for the LA Clippers? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think it's fantastic that the NBA is the league that people like Steve and Mark Cuban and everyone else have have chosen to invest in because it, it, it's a perfect combination for you know the future of the sport and obviously their interests and and the networks that they bring. I mean, for us at the Clippers. You know, I wasn't here right when he owned, right when he bought the team. Um, so there was obviously a tremendous amount of excitement about his ownership. But as the team has now sort of, you know, really got into the the feeling, the effects of his ownership, what is great is that he's created a culture where it literally feels like anyone from the receptionist to the president can come up with the next best idea yep. and be heard. And, and in fact, he sponsored and we ran an innovation tournament for the entire company a month ago um, where everyone participated and we came up with 200 new ideas uh, for all aspects of the business. So when he talks about innovation, it isn't just technical, it's, it's everything. And that really has created this mindset of being a startup within an NBA team environment. Oh, um, very cool. And then... Which is super cool, right? And, you know, some startups are kind of hot messes. Mm. But, um, but this is a startup within a, a very organized business and with the right leadership and the right process behind it. And what that is now doing is flourishing, mainly because Steve's set it on the right path, and then he's put his money where his mouth is, and he's invested behind it. And I'm actually not talking about dollars so much as I'm talking about a spirit of really wanting to do something different and do something for the sake of innovation. Um, and that's our OTT product is a perfect example of that, right? It is very easy in this business to take rights fees as checks from broadcasters and therefore think your job is done Completely, and think yeah. that, you know, Oh, the broadcaster will innovate, but they don't because mm. they've got to make back that money. Yep. Right. And so Steve really is, is, proven that he wants to innovate in the broadcast space with this over the top product and not just do it for the Clippers, but do it for the whole league and really sports in general. And I think that's perfectly emblematic of working for Steve. He wants to do things that impact the Clippers and impact LA for the better, but that have a much bigger impact across the league and sport as well. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, back to your point on, you know, why guys like Steve and Mark Cubans and that of the world are attracted to, to the NBA, I do think it is on on that overall strategy of the NBA in the way that it does push out its content and how it has embraced these new platforms. You know, if you look at other leagues that are still sort of playing whack-a-mole with rights, you know, rights popping up on different platforms and they don't want people to see, um, you know, highlights on YouTube or highlights coming up on on uh, on Facebook or, you know, we had the fast last year with the, with the NFL teams not being able to share gifts of their own highlights on their own cha- on their own channels whereas the NBA has sort of pushed out oh, the yeah. content everywhere and it, it gives you such a, a stronger base it gives you such a stronger embedded global base that it does you know it does it does roll into broadcast you know if someone does see a gif you know and yes we we miss the the death of vine and that but that used to be you watch a highlight you saw Blake Griffith dunk on someone and what did you want to do you wanted to open your phone and open up League Pass and watch the game or or flick it on TNT or ABC or ESPN. It would drive people to it. And I think that that foresight to see, hey, this is where all the content's going. We have to be on these platforms. They will come back. And then having that leap of faith, like you said, with looking at OTT, you know, that looking what uh, uh, the WWE did with the wrestling and, and moved away from its cable money to pr- produce its product, it took them nine months to get their – million subscribers in that break-even space, but now that's the way that their fans consume their uh, consume their content. So it only took it only took the WWE nine months to retrain their fans for forty years of, of of this is how you consumed our product. 
with like the consumer now is it very easily trained. It's very true. And the best part is his smartphones have trained him already. Yeah. Right? Like for some reason, we've all been content to just watch a feed of a game on a device that has a thousand different interactive features to it. Right? So it's like, wait a minute. You know, we're now almost ready for the next thing in sports because we're ready to touch and play and interact with our viewing experience. We've just never really been able to have it in one place. It, you know, it's been a lot of distributed two or three screens. So it'll be interesting to see what fans want and where it goes next. <laughs> and and that's and that's the thing. The good thing now that if you take, you know, with the position you are now and trying to still put that futurist hat on, right? So you've had that futurist hat on this whole time. You, the infrastructure that is is now in place. Like if you go back to those initial implementations, you did IMG and you tried to roll up video, and the internet wasn't fast enough to be able to have capacity to do it. You know, and you had those dial up speeds and. And but now the infrastructure is getting in place. You're getting all the platforms lining up to say we're all going to do video, we're all going to do live video, we're all going to do VR, we're all going to do 360. And it's like, well, which of these are we going to put a bet on? And you pretty much have to put a bet on all mm-hmm. of them because you don't know what the fan. And then you just follow the data that says, oh, the fans do want that, and they do want this experience, and they do want this type of content. Um, so it makes it very makes yeah. it very tough. But you just bet on all the horses. Exactly. And they're going to tell us, right? Mm. And then we'll rebet and we'll reshuffle yeah. um, and we'll keep iterating. And and so it sort of comes into the same method as early, that, those super long-term, long-term bets. We're in that same position. You can't make those long-term bets because we need to figure out, you know, which VR platform is going to be, you know, the VHS beta type thing. We're having those same sort of uh, debates on all of these new platforms and they'll eventually settle and find their place um, but you've got to be able to understand how the different platforms work and what content's going to work and that kind of stuff. So you've just got to make sure your team is malleable and enough to to tackle whatever is in front of them. Yeah, and really, and follow the money. Oh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things that we could do, <laughs> right? Like, there's a we could do a lot of things every day, um, but there's really that sort of subset that fans want partners want and um and we really think is best for the team you know as a brand as a whole oh gee i wish it's sort of like follow the money advice if you'd given that to jack dorsey at twitter like five years ago it would be a completely different product twitter's so fascinating (laughs) i I love that product and it just every time you think it's going to go away they keep evolving it and changing it and i hope it never goes away oh, <laughs> but i agree with you <laughs> I, I i agree I, I love twitter i help build up my business on twitter i helped connect with a lot of people on twitter but they just they're just they're just treading water at the minute and they need to figure out something to go you know this is our this is our north star and really then that north star needs to be some revenue they need to go this is what's going to make us revenue let's go after that and if if the people who were on Twitter in 2007 don't like it, well, it doesn't really matter because we need people from 2017 to like it. Like they 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 listen far to, they listen to far the far two of the few, and they don't listen to the the bigger picture of hey, this is where we should go. So I'm I'm hoping they could pivot, but you know, if they had one mantra, I'll follow the money. Well, they'll at least get out of where they are, and then they can at least go hey, this is where we're headed. Um, and right, um, but it is yeah, it is a good it is a good mantra both from a obviously the partnerships guys will and the, the sales guys will always do that. Um, and I, when I'm always talking to the digital teams and reluctantly working with the partnership guys, it's like if they bring in more money, you get more new shiny toys and people. Like that's that that's how it works. If the money is being driven in, then that content team expands because you can easily attribute that success to that team. So it's one of the it's one of the simple hacks that, that we do with trying to get the digital and the sales team working together is to just have a sales leaderboard of all the sales that digital has brought in or attributed to digital. Because normally people just look at digital as a as a cost center of oh look at all those people costing us money. But if you can say here's all the digital revenue we brought in, it's something that, that team can have pride in. And you're right before you were saying sales team like to sell stuff that sells a lot. When they start seeing that chart go up and up, they go, oh, we'll sell more of that because they just get super motivated by making more sales. So it's a super, like it's a, it's a bit of a hack of, hey, this is just showing you where the digital revenue is, but it starts showing the importance of what digital can do. 
Totally true. And and the fact that it isn't just also like, hey, I've got to go get a sponsor in order to do this. Yeah. But you're right. Like, as more sponsors do, the, the digital department grows. I mean, our team went from the most requests were coming from the community foundation team yep. and the PR team last season to now the most requests come from the sponsorship team. Yep. Um, and as a result, they've added people. We've also added other revenue. We've now added revenue streams from social sales leads yep. and from the direct Amplify program on Twitter. So now the digital team makes money 24 hours a day. Yep. And it and it gets small, it, but it's growing. But it lets them walk around with their head up high and go, "Look at us! Look at the money we're bringing in!" And it gives them the confidence. But then it also, when they're going to produce that next piece of content, it do, it makes that easier piece to go, "Hey guys, this is going to be cool. Who can you sell it to?" Because they have they're following the money. They're just going, "Oh, we want to we want to see that chart chart go up." So it's just you know, it's a real. Uh, I think it's a real important thing to 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 make sure that the the, the digital team realizes the value they're driving. Because you can quite easily quantify it just on the reach and the amount of fans they're engaging and they're warming up all these ticket audiences, all of that kind of stuff. But then when if you just also then say, oh, here's the money that they're bringing in. Um, and because the ticket guys, they have a number, their number's up on the board. The sponsorship guys, they have a number, their number's up on the board. Like it's just good to get that digital team overall to say, hey, this is our number and this is the number we're chasing down. Um, so, yeah. Really lovely uh, catching up again. Um, I'm going to finish off with my closing five uh, to get a little bit more insights. All right. Uh, do you remember the first sports event you ever attended? I do. It was a Cleveland Browns game at Cleveland Municipal Stadium, also known as the center of sadness, according to Siri. <laughs> center. <laughs> Did they win? Or is that, is that too, is it a too hurtful question? Does that bring up bad memories? That's a foregone conclusion. No, it was the Browns. They did not. <laughs> uh, so when you go to a, a an arena or a ballpark, do you have a favorite food? Is it, Have you been to a, a an arena or somewhere where they've just gone over the top with some food? Or are you, this is my food when I go to a sports venue and this is what I always consume? I, I will obsessively look for anything Buffalo related, meaning the sauce. Okay. So the wings or anything like that, as long as it's, it's smothered in yeah. buffalo sauce, it gets your ticket of approval. It, exactly. It could probably be a cricket in buffalo <laughs> sauce and I would eat it, but yes. <laughs> and so what's your, what's your first app that you open up in the morning? A uh, Flipboard, Flipboard, obsessively. Yep. And that's your go-to yep. news curation space? For everything, Yeah. Have you have you created your own little subsets, or have you sort of just lent into the Flipboard algorithm and said, "Show me what you got"? A little bit of both, but I have twenty nine active magazines that I curate across lots of different topics, most of which are public. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to get those links and ch check them out. I, I'm a in and out user of Flipboard. Um, I, it, it's not it's not right in my rotation. I use I, I've been finding myself using Nuzzle a lot. Um, oh, I like Nuzzle. And so Nuzzle is a something like, yes. you know, hey, Jack, go buy Nuzzle. Put Nuzzle into Twitter. That would make Twitter awesome. Um, right? You know, because it, And charges 99 cents a month to use Twitter. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, Nuzzle, if, I think I have spoken about it before. It, you know, it curates what, uh, what your friends and uh, your Twitter followers or your LinkedIn audience are liking and, and tweeting and posting. So it effectively just bubbles up, you know, the hot items, um, that kind of thing. Which I think Flipboard is in that in that but same did, sort of realm. Yeah, but you can game Nuzzle. Watch what Business Insider does. They will they will tweet something out from three or four of their handles, and it'll game Nuzzle. It'll come to the top. Yep. <laughs> everything everything is there to be gamed. Um, like let's just True. put that on the table. And <laughs> as a sports content and a, a sports marketer, you should be being aware of that. Because yeah, exactly. You can game it. As, you can game it as well. Like you push out a big piece of content, and you make sure that four of your players also tweet it out, and that, and boom, it it goes to the top of all the different algorithms. So it's like I I, I do like that you say it can be gained because everything can be gained, and you need to know how to do it if you want to get the best, biggest bang for your buck. The whole time of okay, here's our launch, and we post it. That's not it. It's hey, what do we got to do to make all the you know all the algorithms sit up and take notice. Um, so if it's something as simple it's as so true, 
As if it's something as simple as, oh, we're launching a team podcast. Cool. You put out the podcast, you put out four episodes, and then you get everybody in the organization to leave a review. And what do you know? You are now at the top of the iTunes charts, right? Everything can be gained. Um, and it's uh, it's true. You should always be looking, always be looking out for that. Um, if there's someone you think the Sports Geek podcast listeners should follow, whether they be someone, an author, or a, or a, just someone who works in the business, or someone who blogs, or a writer, is there someone that you would nominate to say you should be following this person? Ah, great question. Um, because I know he's prolific on Twitter for sure. I'm going to say Zach Sugarman. Uh, he runs the uh, properties digital at Wasserman. Okay. And he's a good friend of mine, but he's he's a smart guy, and I think right on about his perspective on the business. Terrific. And uh, in Kevin Durant style, you're the real MVP. Which what is the what social media platform is your MVP? Instagram. Instagram. Why? <laughs> Mainly because it fascinates me. Um, what you can, how easily we can all be better photographers yep. and the social nature of still images. It's fascinating that it continues to be so strong. It is, it, it is because it's almost like, even though we were saying before we, we want more content, at some point we say, enough with the words, show me pretty things. Right. And you end up on Instagram. Exactly. Exactly. And my dog has more followers than me. I don't know how it works. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a few friends that have their dogs have more followers, so that might say something about the Instagram audience more than anything else, and the fact that then there's a lot of dog. Or me. Then there's a the fact that there's a lot of dog Instagrammers that then go around following other dogs, and so it's really a false economy. They're all gaming the system. See, we're back to gaming it. <laughs> <laughs> One last question, because I was when I was uh, doing some extra research after catching up, I found out that you're a helicopter pilot. <laughs> and that is true. Yep. That is fascinating. If it flies, I'm into it. And so how often do you, uh, do you fly? How do, how, how do you get into becoming an, a helicopter pilot? So living in LA, you see them flying over your head all the time. Yep. And I had a point in my life where I wanted to learn something mechanical. Yep. I, was, I never had the dad that was under the car. And um, so I took one lesson and literally they no sooner lift you off the ground and they're like, okay, you're in control. Go for it. And I was hooked ever since. And so I fly almost weekly, uh, two seaters, four seaters, and um, I also picked up my commercial drone license because I, I don't know if it, as rotors I like it for some reason. Oh, terrific! Well, next time in LA, I'm going for a helicopter ride. I'm putting my hand up for that now. Come for a ride. We'll do a video podcast next. Oh, definitely, definitely. Well, thank you very much, Jen, for coming to the podcast. Where can where can people find you on the internet? Where's the best place? Twitter for sure. I'm at Van Dyke. Because I was one of those back in 07 that was on the platform early. Very good. Well, we'll put the links into the show notes. Uh, please send Jen a tweet that you've listened to this uh, podcast. Thank you very much for coming to the show and I uh, look forward to catching up with you in LA sometime soon. Can't wait. Thanks, Sean. Talk to you soon. Sign up for Sports Geek News at sportsgeekhq.com slash sign up now. Thanks again to Jen. You can reach her. You can send her a tweet, Van Dyke, V-A-N-D-I-J-K, on Twitter. As she said, she was one of the early ones, and she just secured her last name. Very cool. Um, and I do recommend, I've now recently, uh, just after our conversation, started following Jen and some of her flipboards. So search her out. I'll put links to her flipboard uh, her, to her flipboards in the in the show notes. But if you're a flipboarder like uh, Shane Harmon, with his sports biz flipboard, uh, uh, you should be uh, you should be following Jen. She's sharing some really cool stuff on different on different things and in different uh, magazines. Uh, so the last thing before this pop, uh, podcast ends, it's it's sort of something that sort of we touched on a little bit in the conversation with Jen. I'm working on a new service to help take away some of the pain that we that that was discussed on the on the podcasts. I want to rid the sports digital world of terrible digital sponsorship campaigns um, I've seen too many um, I've seen I've been handed too many and said hey can you drive more traffic can you can you get the fans involved can you get them to enter um, it's very hard to I'm gonna now I'm gonna say it it's very hard to make it look good it's it's like putting glitter on a turd uh, and so we really should be starting to get to a point where those campaigns are better in sync with what digital team is doing 
are better for the fans and in an end result, better for the sponsors. So I'm working on a partnership with the guys at Tradable Bits uh, to take away that headache and headache and offer a done for you service. So enable you to not worry about the execution piece. You say, we want a cool campaign for our fans. The sponsor wants something cool that, that really reaches our brand and we'll help come in, build the campaign, build out the advertising campaigns and execution pieces so you make sure the sponsor gets the, the appropriate numbers they want in terms of reach and, and get inside right in front of the right fans, but also get the results, get the signups and the leads if they are looking for that type of thing. Um, and the other side of it, which is a, also a big pain and a headache for either the commercial teams or the, or the digital teams, is, is that reporting and the valuation of the campaign. That's what we're going to be providing in this done for you service. So, um, and you know, and the other part of it is, if you even need our help to help sell it to the sponsor to convince them why it's a good idea, we are more than happy, more than happy to help you sell it to the sponsor because we're all about following the money. As Jen said, following the money. If we can get more money uh, in uh, your digital team's pocket and grow that digital revenue, as I sort of discussed there with Jen, um, everyone's a winner. So if you're interested in this service, as I said, we're bringing it out, uh, putting it together now. It's going to come in, uh, come out in beta in a few weeks. Um, but if you're in that position, either as uh, working on the commercial side saying, I really want to build out better campaigns and deliver better results for sponsors, give me a call. Um, or if you're on that digital team side and you want to you want to start doing cooler things from a fan engagement space and you have that uh, fractured relationship with commercial, again, as discussed, you know, I play that digital divorce counselor quite well. Uh, so, yeah, send me an email, uh, sean at sportsgeekhq.com or hit me up on the Sportsbiz Slack um, because you should be part of the Sportsbiz Slack now. There's now over 900 members of the uh, Sportsbiz Slack community. Uh, simply go to sportsgeekhq.com slash Slack uh, to sign up. And if you are already a member, please send that send that link to your colleagues. Uh, get them involved. It's, I'm really good. Uh, I'm really liking seeing multiple people from teams, people from their data departments talking in the data channel, digital people talking in the digital channel. Uh, um, Jolly is doing a terrific job managing the community, managing the invites as they keep increasing. Our next goal is 1,000. I really want to reach it really soon. Um, So again, if you haven't signed up, do it now. Um, If you signed up and you've forgotten about your invite and you haven't signed and you haven't done, please reach out to myself or Jolly and we'll we'll get it sorted. 1,000 is the... uh, is the next milestone so that's it from me uh until next episode stay tuned for the sounds of the game uh taken by my uh snapchat spectacles at la um that'll be that'll that'll be the sounds of the game segment for this week so until next time uh, my name is sean callanan and you've been listening to the sports geek podcast like the sports geek podcast Find us on Facebook.com slash SportsGeek. Check out which teams work with SportsGeek at SportsGeekHQ.com slash clients. Please leave a review on iTunes. Go to SportsGeekHQ.com slash iTunes. Thanks for listening to the SportsGeek Podcast. Games are out of start. Unfortunately, no LeBron, no Kyrie, and no love. Oh well, can't complain.